Welcome to the next of my military history Q&A number four on day 87,000 of the coronavirus. And for those of you who are watching in the future in, you know, year 3000 and you go back in coronavirus, what on earth was that? And you can say, well, some people got an excessively bad cold and shut down the whole planet and locked everybody inside, forcing them to do military history Q&As. So, good for them. Thank you to the future. Um, okay, so I really, really appreciate all of you writing in. I appreciate you guys following and giving this a boost. It is helping on these hot and sunny days as it turned into. And just for that, I broke the laws and got a haircut just for you. No, not you. You Next to you. Good. We got some questions. We have a really interesting episode today that I have personally looked forward to because we get to dive into some really important people and why and how. And I am so sorry. You know how delicate I am. I would never purposely offend anybody. As you know, um, I am political correctness itself. However, today I have dug up a whole lot of facts about a certain Mr. Winston Churchill that some of you, if not familiar with, uh, may find somewhat troubling given what you have been taught through regular mainstream history. And to his official historian, may he rest in his grave, I'm so sorry you did not tell the whole story. I will try to give some more insight into what really happened with Winston Churchill, how and why. Another really powerful, important person, Martin Borman. Uh, got a great question. What do I think happened to him? I think something. And he is a very important person. If you have not heard of him, you need to watch this because you need to know who this person was or is um, and what happened to him. However, we're going to start light. We're going to start with my favorite question and my least favorite question. Uh, what tank or piece of armor would I consider the best in World War II and which one would I uh, ride in or ride World War II out in? Yeah, okay, well, doesn't matter. Which tank would I spend World War II in and why? Now, those of you who know me may know that I have a specific and deep-rooted love for the assault guns. I don't know why you would know that. And I have to pick the assault gun as the tank I would uh, spend World War II in. And if you evaluate a tank or an assault gun, you have to look at a couple of different things. You have to look at the economics. Um, is it a viable war-winning weapon? Is it uh, a pro or a con, plus or a minus, for the war industry as a whole? Because you need to build them. You need to have people uh, volunteer to sit in them. Uh, are the crews the best? Or why were the crews the best? And I'll tell you, the assault gun crews all volunteered. So that means you got good guys running these things which means you have a good, well-disciplined unit. And having written about uh, for the Assault Gun Brigade uh, 236, they were very disciplined. They were a well-driven, well-motivated, well-led uh, brigade. Um, the soldiers were well-trained. They took care of each other. The officers led from the front. Um, that's the things you have to look into. Who are you sticking in these tanks next to? And if you have to look at the economics, um, do you have about 10,000 assault guns built? They were about 82,000 Reichmarks to build. Then you have the main battle tank of the German war, was the Mark IV. It was about 103,000 Reichmarks to build, give and take. And there was about 8,500 of those built. Now, every one of you expected me to say the Tiger tank. Come on, just admit it. You thought I was going to say Tiger tank because we all like our Tiger tank because they're big, they're powerful, they scared the enemy they came across, they were well armored, they had a great 88, and they would destroy anything they came across. However, the Tiger tank cost a quarter of a million Reichsmarks to build, which means for every one Tiger tank, and there's about only 1,300 of them built. For every one, you could have three assault guns. For every five, Panzer V, you could have six assault guns. And when you put the 75mm tank uh, cannon on the, on the Sturmgeschütz and you send it off to war, it was a phenomenal weapon on the battlefield. It would destroy just about any Russian tank. It, it was a well-armored, 
well-balanced piece of uh, piece of equipment. It did a phenomenal job in destroying Russian tanks. Um, there was a lot of them built. They did not have a hazardous effect on the war economy for Germany. Now you could of course also say, why didn't I take the T-34? There was a lot of T-34s built. And T-34. Now I'm not going to difference between the T-34 and the T-34 A-5 with a longer gun. I'm just going to say T-34. You also have to look at survivability. If you're going to stick yourself in a, in a piece of armor, you like to come out on the other end of the war. The Russians, at the beginning of the war, they had about 20,000 tanks when the war started. They got about 22,000 tanks over the course of the war from the Allies. And they built about 84,000 tanks. So the Russians built 84,000 tanks. They got 20, they had 22. Throughout the entire war, they had about 84,000 tanks destroyed. So let's see, if you build 84,000 T-34s, and you have 80... 4,000 destroyed, that doesn't leave a whole lot of survivability for the crew. You got in a Russian tank during World War II, especially the opening years on the Eastern Front. The Russian T-34 was built to basically get to the battlefield and if it made it for a couple of days, outstanding. If it didn't, well, it wasn't really expected to. Their crews were not particularly well trained initially because they weren't expected to survive very long and a lot of them really didn't. Of course, a lot of these tanks were repaired and a lot of them still run today. The T-34 was a great tank, absolutely, but it's not the one I would want to sit in, uh, in during World War II because the chances that I would be picked up by uh, some German anti-tank gunner was really, really high, far higher than for the assault gun. Why wouldn't I want to sit in the Tiger tank? A lot of Tiger tanks got, came in the war when Allied air power started getting really good and started picking out Tiger tanks with the rockets, especially on the Western Front after D-Day. A lot of Tiger tanks, they never made their first shot because they got picked up by the air. I don't like those odds. They are an enemy fire magnet, although you are pretty safe. But if you look at the very best of aces, Michael Wittmann, he still got killed in his Tiger tank. So, you know what? I will sit in an assault gun that's used to hiding inside a bush or a haystack or some discreet place and pick off enemy tanks. There's a great story from, by the driver and I cannot for the life of me find that uh, location of that, that battle and I'm really sorry. One of you will find it and tell me. Um, where you had a, a eight or ten assault guns, Sturmgeschütz, sitting on, on the slope, on the back slope of a hilltop, and picked up 130 some Russian tanks in a matter of a day engagement. Uh, the German high command didn't even believe the numbers, they had to send somebody out to count them. Um, that gives you some idea. You're looking at 10, 15 uh, Russian tanks destroyed per assault gun in that one engagement. And with the side skirts, with the up armored, with the nacelle, with the, the assault gun was a good fighting weapon, and that's the one I, w I would pick. Uh, I, I gotta say, it is the best bang for my money. And if I had been in Germany at the time, there's a lot of tank models that I would not have built, but I would have put my money on more Sturmgeschütz. And when I say assault guns, I also mean the Hetzer, they're built on the, T, uh, on the T-38 chassis and uh, even the Yacht, uh, the Yacht Panther, and, and it was a good idea. And Sweden still have that same concept uh, in use today with the turretless guns. You sit and you wait for the enemy to come up. Sometimes you follow the infantry into battle because that's what they were originally designed to do before World War II came, brave, broke out. The idea was that as an, in, an infantry support weapon uh, to follow the infantry and blow up obstacles and then it turned out they were incredibly good at taking out enemy tanks and they were upgraded and that sort of is how we come to think of them but they were certainly also for enemy uh, for, for for infantry support and that brings me to the question that i don't like some of you have watched some of my movies and for that i'm very sorry um 
I got a question. It's not really a question, it's a statement. In some of uh, the war films we've done, we have had infantry charges led or supported by uh, assault guns. In our case, I think it was mostly Hetzers. And somebody ranted or raved on about that's not what they did, and they didn't do that, and that, that's it. and you are wrong. You're not going to call the guy who wrote the book about assault guns and tell me something about assault guns. So there. I'm going to explain to you. The assault gun was very much an infantry support weapon. At the latter stage of the war, when German tanks became more and more scarce, granted, the infantry would link up with whatever units, they, they, whatever armor the, there was, especially for breakouts and encirclements or break-ins or limited charges and attacks uh, to straighten out lines and what have you. But absolutely the assault guns, the Sturmgeschütz, the Hetzers, they worked with infantry on numerous accounts uh, to break through lines. And uh, sometimes uh, as a really good idea, sometimes a very bad idea, was some very bad, uh, especially at the very latter stage of the war when the Russians wised up, if there was limited charges or breakouts, they would let the assault guns break, uh, roll past the, uh, their, their anti-tank guns and they would shoot them up from behind, from the sides, what have you, and pick up the infantry so they couldn't support. But assault gun infantry, uh, from the very beginning of the war, worked very well together. So that is absolutely a historical correct part in, uh, in my movies that, that we use there. In fact, I will read you an excerpt of a, a book. I don't know who wrote this book. Oh, wait, I did. I love when I can sit here and I can quote from my own book. Ha! On the night of the 4th and 5th of February 1945, Battery Commander Lieutenant Rudiger Madiga, the younger brother of the Oberleutnant Madiga, who was in charge of the whole battalion, ordered the support battle group Nice against a night attack in Gütersheim. After reaching Strelen, they were to return. They both had objections to the nonsensical use of assault guns in a night attack, and it turned out these were well funded. Like I said, it did not always work out well. Uh, this time it did not work out incredibly well because, oh wait, you have to read the book. Um, but it did happen and incidentally the book is not for sale right now because I signed a deal with Casemate Books who write and publish incredibly good uh, World War II books. They are going to do a, uh, a really good layout, professional version. Um, uh, they're going to edit some of the spelling errors that a certain editor left in the book and since my um, a couple of weeks ago we did a little bit on Stalin and how the Russians did things I found out what to do to thank him for that piddle mistake <laughs> problem solved and rewrite on the way but yes I will take the assault gun and I will crawl in that during World War II more so than any other that was that. Now we are on to something much more fun. To the next question that is rather serious because it has some rather significant historical implications if you really dive into it. Winston Churchill, is he all he was cracked up to be? We all know of Winston Churchill, the Prime Minister of England during World War II. He stood up to Hitler and he helped Britain through the war and he defeated the Nazis, and then he went out of office uh, pretty much right after the war. Winston Churchill was one of those larger-than-life personalities uh, of, the, of the 20th century, most certainly. And he was, in that right, absolutely he was a great and unique person. What he did uh, during World War II and how he did it. I will try to take a two-pronged way of answering this question because I think it's important, especially as a historian at this point in time, we need to have an open conversation about how the sausage is made. Nobody wants to see how the sausage is made because it's pretty messy. But the way the sausage was made during World War II or World War I, or today, has not changed. Politics are messy. Intelligence work is messy. 
and the way things were done are not black and white. Nothing is black and white. It's all gray. And when we dive into the gray, you'll find out that people you thought were great, amazing heroes have done rather unsavory things in order to get to do the good things they did. So there's a balance. If you ask me uh, as, a, as a patriot, as somebody who was, who was proud to have, have worn the uniforms I have, I understand why he did what he did. I understand it. Some of it I even somewhat could agree with. And some of it I absolutely cannot agree with or accept. Uh, and that's what I'm going to try to get into. Take Winston Churchill, first Lord of the Admiralty initially, uh, the Gallipoli landings during World War I. Every great British military mind knew this was a really bad idea. So did Winston Churchill. He wrote, this was Dardanelles, bad idea, cannot win. Yet he insisted on it. And lo and behold, 40,000 dead soldiers later, British, Australian, New Zealanders, fighting for absolutely nothing, uh, accomplishing absolutely nothing, being defeats by, by the Turks, they all tucked tail and left. And Churchill was removed from that position. Then we can talk about the Norway landings before he became Prime Minister when Hitler was heading to Norway and Britain was heading to Norway. That went very sideways as well. But Churchill didn't really get any, any negative on that one and indeed he became Prime Minister afterwards. But there's a lot more to this. If you look at Churchill the person, and I think we need to look at him as a person, he said um, he went to war to protect the British Empire, but the way he conducted the war destroyed the British Empire. He went to war uh, against Hitler, who had offered military aid to England to protect her sovereignty and her colonies. Bet you didn't know that. That's a little different. Okay, you can also then you can say, well, Hitler made a lot of promises. He just wanted everything on his terms. Fine, but that's what he said. But what did the American president say? In 1942, Roosevelt actually said it should be their aim to destroy the British Empire. That's what Roosevelt said. He was allied with Churchill. You know, friends like these. Um, I'm just saying, everybody in World War II had very different motivations for what they did. Churchill bankrupted the British Empire through Lend-Lease, through his loans, through the way he waged the war, through the way the war uh, ended. And there's statements from up by the royal family at the time that they were very unhappy with uh, the way uh, Churchill ran the war. You can say he felt morally obligated to fight uh, Adolf Hitler knowing for what he stood. But how much did he know how where he stood? The two never met. Uh, Hitler was quite open about wanting the terms of Versailles thrown out. He wanted lost territories back. That was never a secret. Uh, he also talked about uh, living room to the east. He wanted to expand uh, Germany's influence towards the east. But he never wanted, Hitler never wanted war with England. He was very adamant about that and spoke very favorable about England in his speeches and to his private staff and friends. That does not necessarily mean anything. Apparently it didn't because they went to war against each other after all. My contention always was that there need not have been a war between Germany and Britain at the time. Back to the moral part, what was done in the time uh, Hitler was in office and uh, you see the war crimes that was committed and the atrocities and the infractions of uh, sovereign territory and invasion of uh, other nations by the Germans at the time, you could say yes, that morally obligated you to fight and resist. Germany invaded Poland. Morally, yes, you should declare war. However, what would have happened if Britain and France had insisted on the, to the Poles 
that they gave Hitler the port of Danzig. They appeased Hitler the last several times in Czechoslovakia, Sudetenland, Austria. Um, so Hitler had no real reason to think that they would react any different. Now, uh, I digress a little, I know, but this, this all ties together. We could have seen a very different World War II. Churchill was always very adamant about going to war and opposing Hitler for moral grounds, for uh, the protection of the British Empire, although I don't think Hitler had any designs on the British Empire. Uh, he may have had designs on other empires and other peoples, certainly. Uh, I don't particularly think that Hitler would have had any interest in invading France. Um, got in the territories, he would have looked east. Churchill also declined every peace offer made by the Germans. So the moral obligation for the Allies to fight uh, the Nazi machine, I can see that. And I can see why they would believe that. Now remember, at the time, they did not know what we know now or knew after the war. They only knew very little of what was, what was going on. So when you talk about Churchill and Churchill's values and morals, you also have to look about what kind of person was Churchill, uh, besides a hapless drunk but we'll get back to that. I don't think that's a secret anymore. However, in 1937, uh, Heinrich Brüning, the German Chancellor until Hitler took over, and I think he resigned in 1932, I think he resigned in 1932, he wrote Churchill about who was funding Hitler at the time, about uh, some of the German uh, Berlin banks that had uh, funded Hitler, he also wrote him about how French intelligence and how U.S. arms manufacturers uh, had helped fund Hitler's campaign. And we know this because the letters in the files, because Bruning wrote Churchill in 1947 asking him to please not uh, release that letter because it might cause some embarrassment. Interesting thing was some of these people were related to people that had funded Churchill. Churchill went broke. He put his, his house, uh, Churchill House, it was on, on sale because the markets had crashed and all of a sudden he owed uh, some 20,000 pounds. And you see it in the Times, in the February Times uh, edition of 1937, his house is for sale. However, he was bailed out by a Czech businessman who very much opposed Hitler and have to remember what was going on in Czechoslovakia at the time. Uh, between Germany and Czechoslovakia, which was then occupied by Germany around that same time. Churchill had 42 servants, a huge mansion, and he was getting 500, 500 pounds a month uh, for being a member of parliament. Where did Churchill get all his money? There's a lot of files about a lot of people that was giving uh, money to Churchill before the war. Some of these people were very anti-Hitler. Some of them, oddly enough, were some of the same supporters that supported Hitler. However, um, oddly enough, Attlee, who became Prime Minister right after Churchill, also received some number of money from these same businessmen. Now, it's not exactly different in politics today. Politicians, as we can see, are in bed with big business, lobbying groups, and they get money and they vote in the general direction of whoever took care of them, whatever company they are beholden to. It wasn't really any different here. But you can see there's an economic influence on Churchill by people who are very much anti-Hitler. Um, so one would say, does that slant his politics? Does that make him feel obligated to force a war with Hitler when he is economically indebted to people um, who wants that. It's something that we have to at least explore or be open to the possibility of. However, like I said, it's nothing different than any other politician did or does today. So is it, a, is it right or wrong? I don't know, but it's a factor. And it's a snapshot into a personality. Now the joke was always about Churchill. Uh, he drank a lot and he attended cabinet meetings drunk and 
he had meetings with foreign dignitaries while he was drunk and inebriated. Although most of the officially published records do not state it in those very terms, most of the British uh, cabinet members would not uh, put that in the in the minutes. It would be uh, the prime minister was um, uh, very tired, or terms like that. But in on May 10, 1940, in the Roosevelt Diaries, he called him a drunken bum. March 12, 1940, Summer Wells wrote in his report that he saw Churchill blind drunk. However, when you look up, and you go now, look up uh, the official uh, published uh, report, it's not in there. You have to actually go to the archive and find it in the archive where it said that, because the published version yeah, had to be sanitized because that wasn't exactly nice. Uh, McKinsey King, April, April 20, 1940, called him a drunkard. So there's numerous accounts of Churchill going through the war uh, drunk. Um, that that I, I, if he did his job and he drank on the side, uh, what am I? What, what do I care? Um, however, I think it's it's important to note that some of the decisions that he took during the war might have been done while he was vastly influenced by consumption. And I think that is something that, again, also cannot be overlooked. On June, Speaking of that, on June 6th, 1944, he drunkenly ordered German cities to be bombed by anthrax, which would have destroyed most of Europe for a century. The air ministry spent a month talking him out of this until he finally blew it off as, well, you know, we use gas sometimes and sometimes we don't. He wanted to bomb German cities with anthrax. That was uh, Churchill's suggestion. Um, and we'll get back to the bombing of cities and how that really came about. In 1942, Roswell held up a map about how Germany was going to invade South America. And here was the invasion map that had been obtained by the Bolivian military attaché in Berlin in 1942. I think that map is still on display in the museum, in fact. That was a fake that had been made by British intelligence on orders of Churchill. Because Churchill needed to get America into the war. After the fall of France, Churchill desperately needed America to get into the war any which way he could. And that is important because Churchill is facing several things. After the invasion of Poland, everyone declares war on Germany, and then generally speaking, nothing happens. The British pours flyers all over German towns to overthrow uh, Hitler and to, to end the war that way. But no real shooting is going on. No real, nothing. No, no real fighting is going on. It becomes a, a cold war. The French makes a little ten-day foray into southern Germany and then pulls back after after Poland falls. Nothing really happens, except talk, rhetoric. Uh, Hitler wants, uh, wanting to invade uh, France because he's waiting for the French as they're now mobilizing. And the British Expeditionary Corps is going to, uh, to France in the 160,000, 180,000 men. But in the light, the dawn light of World War I, nobody wants to go to war. The British do not want to go to war again. The French definitely do not want to go to war again. Uh, the soldiers don't want to go to war again. It's only 20 years past since World War I, and they did this. They don't really want to go to this again. So it is not helpful that Hitler is sitting in Berlin making peace uh, offers to, um, uh, to especially to Britain, which also grew the British anti-war movement, which was quite strong, and actually demonstrating outside number 10. So Churchill had two problems after the fall, after the war of Poland and that was exasperated even more after the fall of France. He needed America to get into the war, and he needed to get the peace movement to shut up and go away. To do that, he would do things. In 1942, American intelligence in Bogota was approached by British intelligence, who asked them for assistance in assassinating the Colombian foreign minister, who was very friendly and pro-British. The idea was that if he was assassinated, the Germans would get blamed and it would push the Americans closer to, to war, active war fighting on the side of the British. Uh, the, this came up to the White House and they, of course, said no. Um, 
but that kind of imaginations were, were done by Churchill. Uh, Joseph Kennedy, who was the ambassador in, in London, absolutely hated Churchill, and he absolutely hated him too. And remember, everyone is reading everybody's posts and uh, private correspondence because everybody broke everybody's codes pretty much at that point. Churchill actually, no, I'm sorry, um, Joseph Kennedy actually wrote in his diary that he thought Churchill was planning on having the American embassy in, in uh, London bombed to bring America into the war. He actually put in his diary as well, he was sailing back to America on the USS Manhattan, and he wrote if the Manhattan was torpedoed, he was certain that it would have been an act of Churchill to get rid of him or get America into the war. That is how highly Joseph Kennedy thought of Churchill. Um, Kennedy also wrote that Churchill had told him that when Germany started bombing British cities, the Americans would have no choice but to get join the war. It's in the Maryland archives. Go look it up. Don't take my word for it. However, Churchill wanted America involved. On July 20th, 1940, the uh, German foreign minister tried to approach the Americans' uh, embassy in Sweden with a peace offer for the British. Churchill was informed of this uh, at his estate, and he immediately telegraphed Halif Lord Halifax to not accept any German offers. And the British people must never learn of what these offers were. Uh, at the same day, he contacted the air ministry to bomb Berlin. And remember, at this point in time, there was no civilian uh, cities being bombed. Uh, on, on either side, and the air ministry had to turn it down. Hitler made a lot of offers. Okay, Hitler actually offered military assistance to Britain in case her empire was ever threatened. I think that's... Uh, Hitler was a great admirer of the British. Now, you can say, well, Hitler broke a lot of promises. He was a bit of a dictator, let's face it. He wanted to do what he wanted to do. Hitler also said, as a man, I will never break my word, but for my country, I will break it a thousandfold. So, yes, Hitler's offers of peace, we can take it with, with, some, uh, with some caution, let's put it that way. But certainly they were there, and Churchill rebuffed all of them. And you can say that is rather irresponsible. He should at least have heard them out. But he made it clear to all the embassies and everybody that they were not allowed to accept, read, or, or take any of the German uh, peace offers. And I think that's irresponsible. Knowing how many people died during World War I because of bad decision making, I would say this is a bad decision. And again, it leads a little bit of credence to the fact that World War II could have looked very differently um, if the right decisions had been made, or at least a chance had been taken. And then you look again at the order Churchill he sent uh, at Dunkirk when the British forces were pulling back and being evacuated. He gave the commanders straight orders to not inform the Allies on the flanks, uh, the, the French, front, that they were pulling back. He was literally abandoning his allies and the, the British commanders in the field were very, uh, uh, very upset at this. And I guess militarily, I could see you want to protect your own, so you pull your ass out, you don't tell your fighting uh, flank mates that you're doing so. But isn't that a betrayal of your allies? Is that not a snapshot of a psyche? Because Churchill did that again uh, when it became clear in Norway that the invasion attempt of Norway had failed, uh, he told his commanders there to not tell any of the Norwegians fighting on the flanks that they were pulling out and shipped out, and they did so. So, betraying his allies obviously was not a big problem for Churchill. Also, having made plans to invade Norway and Sweden, neutral countries that were not at war, uh, to preempt the Germans of doing so, with the sole reason of occupying the Swedish uh, iron ore mines, Churchill had also no problem doing that. 
So he had no problem invading a, a non-combatant nation. Um, and certainly promises had been made to the Finnish to keep fighting the Russians, but absolutely no help had been given. Which gets us back to one of the things that really does upset me about Churchill. Because it really is all telling, and probably most of you do not know. During summer of 1940, uh, after the fall of France and the Battle of Britain was raging in the skies and the German Air Force were bombing uh, British uh, airports, there were British um, harbors, military installations. Now that's important. No one was bombing British towns, no one was bombing German towns. The civilians was out of this. The Germans were under strict orders from Adolf Hitler to not bomb any British cities. And they had not. And Churchill knew this. He knew this very well because they had read the codes. So Churchill knew that Hitler was not going to bomb British towns. And Churchill was facing again his two problems. The peace movement on one hand and the Americans not willing to enter the war. There's an account of how de Gaulle, it's in de Gaulle's uh, diary of him coming to his estate. We're finding Churchill uh, out on the balcony s screaming to the sky at, at why Hitler wouldn't come. Uh, he wanted Hitler, he, he needed bombing of British cities to begin. And his air ministry had refused to do so, well, knowing what the German response was. It really came to a head in August 24th when a single Heinkel bomber, by mistake, dropped a load of bombs on the very outskirts of London. Um, it got lost, dropped bombs, uh, not a lot of damage was done, and I don't believe any other than a couple of chickens were killed. However, that was the excuse Churchill had been waiting for. He called the Air Ministry directly on the very next day. On the 25th and ordered the bombing of Berlin immediately. Uh, the air ministry had quite some objections, especially uh, the possibility of the German response. But Churchill insisted and the next night Berlin was bombed. Some damage done, some people killed. And Hitler didn't respond. And then again and again for the next 10 days, Berlin was bombed six or eight times, depending on the records. And Hitler did not respond. On September 4th, Hitler actually sent an ambassador to Stockholm with a peace offer, and Churchill refused to let him even accept it. On the 4th thereafter, Hitler told Hess, Rudolf Hess, who had a lot of friends in England with the British aristocracy, well knowing that the British aristocracy was not very keen on Churchill at all. He told Hess to reach out to some of his British friends to try to get uh, the peace offer uh, accepted or heard. Because he thought, and we all know how that ended up with uh, Hess eventually flying to England um, some time later. However, Bombing Berlin eight, six times, eventually something's going to have to give. And on the night of the 4th, Hitler did a speech where he made it clear that if Berlin was bombed again, he would retaliate a thousandfold and eradicate London. And the next night, Churchill sent another stick of bombers to bomb Berlin. And the next night after that, a thousand bombers bombed London. The peace movement had no more cause. British cities were now under attack, and Churchill got what he wanted. Now the war was complete. How many of his British subjects did he let die by that decision? I understand that he had to get Britain 100% on, on board with the war against Germany, but he literally poked Hitler to have British cities and civilians bombed and killed. Hitler had given orders not to do that. I'm, I'm not taking sides. It's all in the records. It's out there for everyone to read. 
and Churchill forced him. You could have said, well, fine, they bombed uh, uh, London, we bombed Berlin once or twice, and we're done. Uh, we proved our point. Churchill took the bombing of civilian cities between Germany and England to that level. Of course, that also alleviated the bombing of military installations and air force installations, leaving them to rebuild. And that's one of the main reasons that Britain really lost, uh, won the air war. The war Britain was, uh, was now being won because Germany was bombing civilians in re retaliation while the military was allowed a respite and could rebuild. So in that state, tactically, yes, it was brilliant, um, the right thing to do. Uh, I have, I say, the people in uniform let us do the fighting and keep the civilians out of it. Certainly Germans bombed other cities. So it's not about taking sides. This is about Churchill's decisions and how they affected the war. Not about who's good or bad, who did what and who didn't do what, because everybody did horrible things in this war. Let's not even try to say that there's any shining white knights um, uh, fighting this war with the Queensberry rules of dueling. So, to a degree, I can forgive Churchill for that if he did it for all the tactical reasons of uh, supporting them, alleviating uh, pressure on the military. But he did it because he couldn't accept a peace offer, because if he did, he would be out of office. Because that's what he ran on. He ran on fighting Hitler. Let's do this thing. Another thing is, Rudolf Hess, the deputy Führer, flew to England with a peace offer to the British, and Winston Churchill refused to meet with him. Now, whether he met with him in secret or not, he's the deputy Führer. He's the closest man to Hitler. He flies there, and Churchill refuses to meet and hear what he has to say. Either he knows what he has to say and doesn't want anybody else to hear it, but somebody locked Rudolf Hess up for the rest of his life and then finally killed him before he was to be released. So certainly Rudolf Hess knew something that nobody wanted to know, even after the war. I don't know if that has anything to do with Churchill's reputation or British royals or whatever it was, but isn't it irresponsible in every which way for one leader, Churchill, to refuse to meet with the leader or the second leader of the country he's at war with? It is an incomprehensive decision, but there's quite a few. When it came to Pearl Harbor, the British broke the uh, Japanese naval codes, and at least five days before, they were pretty damn sure where the Japanese fleet were and what they were up to. Roosevelt knew that most of the Americans did not want to get into another European war. Not at all. But Roosevelt did. Uh, and oddly enough, uh, in the in the 40s, uh, in in a speech, Hitler actually said the only two countries that would uh, benefit from a another European war would be America and Japan. Uh, I guess Japan not so much, but financially, uh, America, God bless America, don't get me wrong, had benefited from World War One. Everybody came out of World War One owing America a lot of money. And they done so, and in America we industrialized, we rebuilt. So why would World War II be any different? It was far, far away, and we could sit here and produce stuff for everybody, sell it to everybody. So let's get involved. I am fairly certain that people very high up knew about Pearl Harbor, and I am very certain that Churchill knew about Pearl Harbor, and they let it happen because that was America's way into the war. You can. Quite, we can we can say that was really slightly unethical. You hang out your military guys to get bombs, so you can get into war on the bigger picture. I'm fairly certain that's what they did. Uh, I don't understand why they had to fry Admiral Kimmel for bunching his airplanes um, after Pearl Harbor, well knowing that they probably knew this was coming and they didn't warn him in time. And I think Admiral, what happened to Admiral Kimmel was absolutely unacceptable. 
because he was told to bunch up his planes against sabotage. Now he got fried for not being ready and having the planes bunched up while he was told to do, and the people who probably knew that this was coming didn't warn him. Didn't warn him in time. Unacceptable, but political leadership versus military, military always gets sacrificed. So, there you go. There's one other thing that really, really annoys me about Churchill. When you see him touring the bombed out cities, the London and ruins, and he's saying, we can take it. Well, apparently he couldn't take it because every time, remember, British had cracked the German codes. So they knew when the big bombing raids were coming. And at least on the daytime before, when the Germans would test the cross beams to triangulate where the bombers were to drop their sticks, uh, that would alert the British to what town the Germans were bombing. So Churchill knew when the Germans were going to bomb what cities. And he always left those cities when that happened. He wasn't in London most of the times that town was bombed. And on the night of the Great Coventry Raid, and this is what really gets to me, if, if, if anything, he would always drive out to Ditchley Manor when he knew London was going to be bombed. Although he had several shelters deep underground in London. He went 150 miles off to one of his uh, cabinet friends' uh, mansion and hid there until the bombing had been done. On the night of the 14th or 15th of November of the Great Coventry Raid, initially Churchill had been informed of three days of especially heavy air raids over London those nights. And at four o'clock on the 14th, he left his office, went through the back door, got in his big limo, and started to drive out of town. He was caught up with a dispatch rider who gave him a letter informing him that the air ministry had discovered that London was not to be bombed, however it was going to be Coventry. So he turned the car around and went back to number 10, waving this letter saying that London was to be bombed, although he read clearly that that wasn't going to happen. And he said to his staff he was not going to abandon London in its time of need and he was going to stay with his staff, well knowing that no bombs were going to fall on London that night. Now, what really bothers me on this, and all this is verified by, by his bodyguard who stole his desk calendar and it was red, and there's, there's enough documentation to back this up. You just have to go into the files and you have to open them up yourself. You have to read what's in the margins because no official historian uh, liked to talk about these things. But this is the one thing that will tip my balance in the Churchill scale. He left number 10. He left his staff, his secretaries, people he worked with and saw every day knowing that the town was going to be bombed for three days, and he didn't say a word. He didn't tell them to take the day off and go, maybe, yeah, you know, you should maybe go sit in the shelter for the next three days. It, it's nice and cool down there. Nothing. He abandoned the people he was the closest to, and he tucked tail, and he was about to flee town. And he only came back when he heard nothing was going to happen. Now, that, to me, is unacceptable. I understand the bigger political ramifications of why Churchill had to get public opinion and had to get America involved in the war in order for it to be won. Because alone with public opinion against him, there's every chance that somebody would have forced a peace offer. And sooner or later, one of Hitler's peace offers would have reached the British public or the royals and they would have forced the issue. He had to avoid that. If he wanted to stay in power and he wanted to get to make, get all the help Britain needed, he had to get America involved and he had to get the peace movement off his back. So if he had to do unsavory things, which I say these things are very unsavory, he did these things for the right moral reason uh, as he saw it. However, again, he pretty much lost the British Empire in the aftermath of this. And one would say there's a reason why he did not win um, re-election 
after the war, which he didn't. Adley did, which is, remember, they have the same two pre-war financial backers. Um, a lot of questions there that I unfortunately don't have any more information about at this time, but it's worth looking into if you really want to look into it. And I'm sorry to say most Google searches are not going to do it. Um, was Churchill a great man? Yes, he was. Was he a flawed man? Yes, he was. Did he do some really bad things? Yes, he did. Did he do some really great things? Yes, he did. Uh, was he all he was cracked up to be? Yes, he was. Um, did he get a whole lot of people killed unneedlessly? Yes, he did. So, now you can judge. What do you think? Uh, what I gave you of information is, is in the archives and the, and the various um, libraries um, that you can look up into. Uh, and uh, Mackenzie King was an interesting. Uh, he was an interesting person, Prime Minister of Canada. He was uh, um, special. Let's put it that way. Um, there's a story in that. There's also a story about how Churchill falsified paintings. Uh, and writings between the wars to make money. He was an interesting character, Churchill, and we've all done dumb things, and that's fine. You would think that Churchill would have learned something after 40,000 British dead at the Dardanelles that you can say he was responsible for. Um, did he love Britain? I believe he did. I believe he very much loved his country. Probably a lot more so than um, his empire because that didn't. Uh, he was ready to sacrifice his empire to save his country. But the way he did it, well, I'll leave that up to you. Eventually, the World War II would have happened, and I could see the problem with having left France and Britain out of World War II. Hitler would have invaded all of Eastern Europe and probably defeated Russia. Then you'd have one large Nazi Reich called Europe. Could that have been a coexistence long term? Maybe. Probably doubtful. Uh, so did he do what he thought he had to do in order to get uh, to a winning position? I will give the man the benefit of the doubt and say yes he did. He did what he thought he had to do. But he should damn well have warned his secretary and his friends when he knew London was about to be bombed. And that, I think, is unforgivable. Next question is... All right, let's talk about somebody else who we cannot really disagree on was a not very nice person, kind of a bad person. He was uh, Martin Bormann deputy to Adolf Hitler, cashier of the Reich. Basically, Martin Bormann was the guy that ran things while Hitler was occupied with the war. He was extremely ruthless and extremely intelligent and extremely hardworking. So when you write me a question about what I think happened to Martin Bormann after the war, it was claimed he died in the Battle of Berlin End of story. That's the official story. They even found the body years after the war. That probably was his. Now, I have looked at this. I've looked at it for a while. And I don't think it is anywhere near that black and white. And I will try to explain to you why Martin Bormann was important and why he and or his legacy is still important to you today. So, bear with me. Um, first of all, before we start talking about he, she, it is, um, I also got questions about what I think about uh, history shows, and we all remember the show Hunting Hitler, where they spend so much time digging around for tunnels in Berlin to see if how Hitler made it out, if he made it out. Now, Bormann and Hitler were uh, always close to each other, proximity. So, yes, Bormann was around Hitler in the bunker in those final days. How long? 
a little hard to say, but we can let, let's start with the official story is after Hitler killed himself, Martin Bormann and uh, Dr. Stumpfnagel, which was like six foot two uh, tall, tall guy, big guy, nasty guy. Um, he's the one that poisoned the Goebbels children and their dog. Uh, they escaped together and were supposedly caught in the crossfire in the streets of Berlin and killed. That's the story. And let's start with, before we anal analyze everything else we know about Martin Bormann, could he escape Berlin? Uh, where it's very simple to say, yes, he could. Uh, ask the same thing about Hitler. We don't have to go into too many details about exactly how. Yes, he could have escaped uh, Berlin. Of course he could. He was in charge of the money. He was the one you were afraid of. If Darth Vader on the Death Star had to have somebody behind him to fix stuff, pay for it, the practical guy, that would be a Martin Bormann to give you an idea. You think Darth Vader is going to run around signing checks for every one of the workers, telling everyone to do this, that, and the other, and order more stuff, and, and have people executed? No, he's the guy behind him. That's who Martin Bormann was to Adolf Hitler. In many ways, he was almost more powerful, because he also controlled access to Hitler, and he controlled the information Hitler got. Um, that is what made Bormann important, especially because he amassed a huge amount of wealth that we'll get into in a minute. But let's take a look at the, uh, at the basics. Uh, the Russians have surrounded Berlin. Uh, everyone is sitting up in the uh, Führer bunker. Hitler is dead and Bormann is now looking at uh, getting out. If we take that part of the story, could he have fought his way out with the uh, remnants of the German SS and, and those fighting their way through the, uh, to the west through the, uh, through the Russian lines? Yes, he could have fought his way out been lucky. Yes, he could have been killed. I don't, really don't think it ever came to that for Martin Bormann. He was not going to amass the kind of money he did to get caught up in last-minute fighting, hoping to get out, just to be close to Hitler at the last days. He knew the war was lost. He planned for this day. He wasn't going to get caught up in, in, in street fighting in Berlin. That wasn't his thing. You can take, for instance, getting out, Hannah Reich, that we've talked about several times before, Hitler's favorite uh, pilot. She flew into Berlin on a Freisler's torch at the, uh, at the very end to try to persuade Hitler in escaping. Uh, officially, and according to her book, he denied, and she left Berlin. Smirsch teams, which are Russian counterintelligence intelligence units, witnessed a woman and two men climb into a Freisler torch and fly away. According to their description, the two men looked like Martin Bormann and his aide. And Hannah Reichi writes in her book that they just barely cleared the treetops um, at the very end of a 900, uh, I don't know, 900 foot street they had, or 900 meters. Um, the Faisal Storch should, uh, could pretty much take off in 50, 50 meters, 75 meters. It didn't need a lot of runway, unless it was extremely overlay, overladen. So yes, if there are two people, would most certainly did it. Remember, um, Skorsena rescued uh, was it Mussolini and stuck him into a Faisal Storch, where there were three people that barely made it off, uh, off the mountain with the, due to the weight. So, Hannah Reich doesn't address this in her book, but yes, she took a couple of people out with her. Um, so that's one way he could have gone out. There could have been a double of Bormann hanging around Berlin um, while he was somewhere else. He could have left the town earlier. And I don't think Hitler would have objected to Bormann saying, I'm going to go sit up uh, for the Fourth Reich somewhere else because Hitler sort of knew where things were going as well, and he might need him on the outside. Indeed, Goering was there, Himmler made his way, made his way out. There were several German uh, planes full of officers that took off from Tempelhof. So there's absolutely possible for Bormann to have left Berlin. 
there, there's no doubt about that. And I don't care, like they do in TV, spend too much time digging around for tunnels, trying to find his footstep, and, and maybe he drops his wallet so we have evidence. It doesn't matter. He could have gotten out if he wanted to get out. The, the Germans had planes like the Junkers uh, 390, uh, the, the 290, even the, uh, uh, the Messerschmitt 264 that could have flown to Spain, could have made it all the way to, to Argentina. Germans had planes that would absolutely fly there. There's always uh, also the, the rumor that he went up to the submarine uh, 234 and uh, in Hamburg and was dropped off in Spain before that submarine eventually surrendered in, uh, in America. There's no shortage of ways he could have gotten out. He could use the red line like so many other uh, Nazis uh, that fled Germany and Austria over the Alps in Italy, fled to Spain, in disguise. Uh, although, again, this is Martin Bormann we're talking about. Nobody knew him, really, or who he was, so he could have gotten a fake ID and smuggled himself out over the Alps, but seriously, as it will appear a little bit sooner, I'll explain it to you, that's not... Imagine a civil war in America and having uh, Dick Cheney uh, try to sneak his way across the Mexican border. No. He had his ways to get out. And I think he did. But you would now say, they found Borman's body. Ah! What about that? Well, all right, let's, let's examine that. Now, we talk about the body. It was said that Stumpfnagel and Borman were killed in the fighting uh, near that bridge in Berlin and the bodies were found by the Russians because his diary was found on one of the bodies. And then, and then what? you saying the Russians found the body and diary of Barton Borman but they didn't take the body with them. But you're saying they found the body, so they buried the body and took the diary? Or they found the diary with the bodies, and they took the bodies. But they didn't, because the bodies apparently were buried uh, right there where they were found in 1972. Now, that doesn't make sense, does it? If the Russians had found the body and diary of Martin Borman, and they would have figured out who he was real soon, they knew, they would have taken the body, just for the heck of it. But let's, for argument's sake, say that they didn't. He died, he was buried there, and the Russians took the diary and, and went on their merry way. Okay, so they find a body in 1972. There's been plenty of excavations of the area, but they find a body. They say it's Martin Borman. Say the dental work matches. And then they start looking at that. Then it turns out that the dental work really doesn't match, and that skull really doesn't look that much like it. So that skull disappears, and sometime after, I think a year after, another skull reappears with some mock dental work that had been fixed in that really didn't convince anybody either. So, all right. Let's say that that disappeared, nothing really happened, that body was uh, declared to be Borman and it was stuck on a shelf somewhere because nobody claimed him. Uh, reminder, Martin Borman had a lot of children uh, and not all of them denounced him after the war. So for them to say, well, here's their dad stuck on a slab somewhere, at least go bury him uh, for 25 years till the next DNA of this uh, skeleton came about, I find that implausible. But okay, again, for argument's sake, make everybody happy. Martin Borman was found in 1972, uh, put on a slab, until we get all the way up to uh, 1997, when there's a book about to come out about how uh, Borman in exile. I believe it was Manning's book, or some other, several books have been written about this. And somebody requested, well, maybe we need to do some DNA about uh, on, on this body to prove that it's Borman. And uh, Katja Anslinger, a German doctor, was kind enough to provide a wonderful lady um, that that I know. Uh, Lawrence DeMello with uh, the autopsy report. Now this is interesting because they only took the mitochondria DNA. They didn't take the nuclear DNA. Now you have a controversial figure like Martin Borman's body that you are very soon about to cremate 
and toss the ashes. Would you not take every single test you could to ensure that this body was actually him to remove any kind of uh, doubt and to have his full DNA profile on file just in case it would ever reappear? But they didn't. They only took the mitochondrial DNA. And why is that important? That is important because they tested it against uh, one of Borman's distant cousins on his mother's side. With mitochondrial DNA, you can only test relatives on the mother's side. And why did they do that? Bormann's son, I uh, believe he lived in Berlin. Bormann's son, I uh, believe his name is Anton, um, he had been, after the war, he became a priest who fell in love with a nun. They both uh, left the church, got married, and he traveled around, very romantic, and traveled around uh, Europe, around Germany, and, and did speeches in schools against the war. Uh, which is uh, honorable. But his son exists. He's a known person. They knew where he was. He's a public person. Why did they not test the DNA against him? And there's the speculation for that very thing. We are all under the assumption, and from what I have studied and what I've seen, I've seen a lot more plausible documentation and reports that Bormann survived the war than Hitler did. So let's say Bormann did survive the war. Bormann was a womanizer. Yeah, he was. Um, he really was. Uh, he was a bit of a horn dog. He had children after the war. And there's a, indeed, his daughter in South America, in Argentina, had come out uh, claiming to be his daughter. And I believe there are other children, one in, in America. So if Bormann had children after the war, their DNA would not be able to be matched up with the mitochondrial DNA. But it would have been if they did the nuclear DNA that they didn't do. Now, it sounds a little bit like a cover-up, doesn't it? It does, it does sound like a cover-up. And I'm saying, if, if you really have an interest in knowing, as you would suppose the German authorities did, but they really didn't. They don't want to know. They don't want to know. They don't want to touch this. They want it all to go away. Um, this is a good way to cover it up. Here's the DNA. It matches some distant cousin. But we can't match it to his son because we didn't take that. And I call that, and you know what's coming. <laughs> Horse shit. But they had the body, they dug it up in 72, that must be the one. Well, we don't really know that the body they dug up in 72 was actually the one that they did the DNA testing of in 1997. Let's just, for argument's sake, all agree that by 1997, Borman was dead. No matter where in the world he would have been, he would be dead. Right? Good. We possibly also could agree that he might even have been dead by 72. I find it very possible that he probably died by 72. Supposedly, he, supposedly, he died in 1969 from cancer, which was supposed to be in Paraguay, is, of course, far from Germany. And they have a distinct red clay in parts of the soil. That red clay was covered in the body that they dug up in 1972 in Germany. So is it not possible Bormann survived the war? He lived. He died eventually in South America. He was buried. Until there was enough pressure in Germany and around, that we need to dig him up, get the body back in here, stick it in this grave, so we can find it and officially say, no, he was killed during the war and here's his body and he was found. Incidentally, he was also, that body was also found with some dental work that was dated post-1945. But, you know, getting ahead of ourselves, let's not, um, let's not say that we, we can't, of course, go check that anymore because the body's done, it's gone, it's cremated and was spread on a river. You know, just like, you know, Bin Laden's body that we all saw before they just in the ocean out there. No, we didn't. No, oh, never mind. Okay, uh, I know, I'm just a conspiracy joke. Give me a break. So now we're getting a little bit closer to, well, yes, he could have lived. The DNA and the body is not conclusive evidence whatsoever that he was killed at the time of the war at the place they said he did. And in fact, uh, there are several very plausible ways he could have left. Um, eyewitnesses have had seen Bormann, uh, one of Juan Perón's officers, 
uh, his name was Juan Silvo Carlotto. He was supposed to be the, the caretaker of uh, Borman. Paid for his hotel bills. He paid. Uh, he lived in room 740 at the Plaza Hotel in Buenos Aires, and Perón paid the bill. Of course, Borman was a guest. A lot of other Nazis went to Argentina, so why wouldn't Borman? And there's a reason why Borman specifically went there to begin with. And again, thank you, Lawrence DeMello. You have done wonderful research, and I always enjoy your stories, and my deepest condolences for your dad. Now, after that, uh, supposedly, Martin Bormann went to Bariloche, where supposed uh, Hitler also lived, if uh, he made it out. And an interesting thing about Bariloche, and the very down to the very tip of Argentina, is it looks very much like a German village. It looks like a little Alpine village. It's, it's beautiful and it's quaint and it's a German population have lived there from way before World War II and a lot of ships went there uh, from Germany before and during the war. Uh, Birlach sort of became the hub for uh, where the uh, old Nazis settled. Interestingly enough, you can say, well, that's all speculation, but maybe it's not speculation because you also had a nuclear scientist, a prominent German nuclear scientist called Ronald Richter, that was funded, sponsored, and, and set up by Perón's government with a nuclear uh, test center uh, in one of the small islands not far from there. So you have a German scientist researching into nuclear matters on the side of Perón down in Birloche. Supposedly Hitler went there. Now the interesting thing about Birloche, you have this little place where supposedly all these Nazis went after World War II. In the way out of nowhere Argentina. A bunch of American presidents went there. Eisenhower went there. Obama went there. What are all these American presidents doing at the last high castle of uh, where Nazis were supposed to have gone? And a lot of presidents in between as well. It's very weird. It's very weird. Um, it's, it's very. Berlusconi is an interesting place. I look forward to going there myself. Um, you, you talk about Hitler's escape. Could he have done? Um, of course he could have. And two trains of thought on that because I know you can ask me next, so I may as well just talk about it now. Do I think Hitler survived the war? If I think back 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 in the before time when I was young and I took my degree in psychology if I think about Hitler's state of mind I don't think he did I think he saw the war lost his mission and vision for his Germany over and impossible uh, surrounded um, Regardless if he was surrounded in Berlin or wherever, the war was lost, his mission was lost, his cause was lost. I don't think there would have been a post-war Hitler. I don't think he saw a reason. Uh, he did what he thought he wanted to do or could do or tried to do and failed and the end was there. And I have no problem accepting uh, his suicide. And for people who say, well, Hitler was a coward, too, too much of a coward to shoot himself. Uh, the man got, what, two iron crosses in World War I for bravery. Um, and at the state of mind and the health and the stress, I, I, it might have been more relief for him. But certainly I have no problem with the, with the concept of, of Hitler having killed himself as indeed most of his staff said he did. However, I also don't have a problem with the idea that he didn't. I have no problem with a double, with him being smuggled out, having been left, and having all his staff, who were absolutely, totally loyal to him, swear up and down under the penalty, oh, under actual torture, as, as it was with, uh, uh, with, with Linga and uh, his driver and valet in, in, in Russian captivity, uh, that he died and they burnt the body and that's where it was. I have no problem accepting that his most loyal inner circle would have stuck to that story and never divulged the truth. If they thought he got out and he got out 
and he was set up in Argentina or wherever else. Then the people who helped him escape, they knew he was alive and they were loyal to the end. And that's, uh, that's how that circle was. These were mostly SS men and secretaries for life and maybe some of them in the bunker didn't even know. Uh, maybe a, a double was smuggled in, maybe there was a body. Um, we all know the body the Russians claimed to have found with a bullet hole in it that they brought to Moscow uh, was not Hitler's body. That turned out to be a middle-aged woman that wasn't even even brown. So it's possible that he could have made it out and I find it possible for exceptionally fanatically loyal staff to have kept that secret and kept to that story. Some will now say, well, the stories differed a little bit. It wasn't the same story. They all had lightly different. Well, of course they did. I mean, first of all, if they were all there at that time and stress and so on, yes, you could remember things slightly differently. Or if you have all constructed the story in order to preserve his escape, um, yeah, they would be a little bit different. I can accept both. Um, now, the interesting thing is it doesn't really matter, does it? because he was never seen again publicly. Uh, there was no 20 years later a legacy video made saying I made it and this is my final testament. Uh, there was no written orders sent out to new Nazis by an Adolf Hitler sitting in, in Argentina or wherever you want him uh, giving orders of the Fourth Reich. So in that sense it doesn't really matter historically if he lived or not because his legacy was what it was and it was unaltered by him being alive and interfering with history later on. So in that sense I, I can accept both stories because I haven't seen any conclusive evidence to either and with all respect for Hugh Trevor Roper who worked for British intelligence who came up with uh, all the story of well this is how it happened this is how he died you work for British intelligence. I'm sorry, I'm not taking your word for anything. You work for intelligence. Ooh. Anyway, so as I said, if Borman survived, why is that important? Because, well, history also never saw uh, Borman again. But history didn't see Borman when he was Hitler's secretary. Yes, he was sitting behind him here and there in the stands, and everybody in the top of the of the Nazi Reich knew who he was and they knew that he held that power that he did. The businesses in Germany, they knew who Martin Bormann was. But the frontline soldiers had no idea. The American GIs fighting had no idea. Uh, the British uh, population had no idea. People in the know knew. No one else does. But his effect and influence on post-war world may be a lot more than you think if we're going to go with all of the circumstantial evidence uh, that has been accumulated on Borman and what he spent his post-war money on. If we talk about the reasons why Borman escaped or could have escaped or should have escaped, he could have done a deal with Western intelligence. Let's talk a little bit about Borman. In 1944 in Strasbourg in the Rote Haus he held a meeting with all top German business officials and he made it clear to them and believe me this room was not bugged he told them all the war's lost he knew the war's lost not a conversation he was going to have with Hitler and anybody else he was a smart man he sat on the money he told them all you're going to start on my mark to transfer all your assets and the, your gold, your valuables, your patents to your affiliate countries outside of Germany. Remember, there was 400 German-owned companies in the United States during World War II, and most of them are actually still here today. All these big German businesses, the only one who weren't there was IG Farben because they were so big, they were already in on it because, let's face it, IG Farben uh, and the Nazis, Rise to Power, and Hitler, and Bormann, they were like this. They were in business together, he didn't have to give them any orders. He started funneling out not only the gold, silver, jewelries that had been stolen by the occupied countries. That started to get funneled out of Germany. All these businesses started transferring all their assets, all their money, all their patents out of Germany to their foreign 
affiliate companies so that when Germany fell militarily and the war was lost militarily there would still be all that money to come back to rebuild Germany and a Fourth Reich. It was quite clear to Bormann if this war was lost and a lot of others by the way this war was lost it couldn't be won militarily. They tried twice. Let's face it, World War I, World War II. Germany could not defeat the world militarily. So they're going to try economically. And in 1942, a concept of a greater economic Reich, how Germany was going to administer this enormous European Union, am I giving it away? Uh, uh, was, was presented to Himmler. Um, by one of the ministers, a Nazi, which we'll see later, actually in 1955, he became the first um, general secretary of the EEC, the precursor to the EU. They were planning for something after World War II, and they needed a lot of money to do it, not to mention that they needed money to keep themselves safe, uh, bribe foreign government officials, because they knew there's a lot of Nazis that did some bad things, they need to get out of Germany, they need to get out and be protected and kept safe, but Bormann was not one to just safeguard his own ass. He had a plan. He knew what he was going to do with all this money and all this gold. First plan, get it out of Germany. Second plan, get it safe. Third plan, resurrect. He was not just going to spend this money on saving his old buddies, because I don't think Bormann gave a damn much about a Nazi ideal or much about his fellow Nazi party members. He thought bigger, and he thought in finances. Plus, Martin Bormann had a link to Alan Dulles, that became the later chief of the CIA. So there's a long history of intelligence services working with each other across the line. Across the lines. After the war, the CIA put uh, Reinhard Geiland in charge of all, all of uh, West German intelligence, and he soon became chief of West German intelligence, when Reinhard Galen, who was in charge of Fremdeheer's Ost, he was in charge of all German intelligence on the East Front, and he had a vast network. That network, including uh, all the peace people in Germany, was absorbed into the CIA without that much supervision. And a lot of Galen's reports went straight to the American president put on CIA letterhead. That is a fact, and it cannot be disputed. Reinhard Galen, when he retired, the three CIA threw a party for him in Washington. The CIA also hired people like Klaus Barbie to go chase communists. Uh, I believe it was Klaus Barbie that was in charge of uh, getting and having Che Guevara killed. They hired a lot of old Nazis, and before you blame the Americans for just doing this, everybody did. The French absorbed a lot of Waffen-SS men into the French Foreign Legion and sent them off to Vietnam to fight the communists there. After all, the Nazis had been defeated, now the communists were the enemy, so my former enemy is now my friend, so we can now fight our future enemy, uh, the Nazis, uh, the communists. That's how things work. It works that way today. Look at Iraq, look at Afghanistan, the people we fought 20 years ago, now half of them is on our payroll. That's just how the ball bounces, as you would say. So to think that the Allied intelligence, whether it be British or American, or Russian, or anybody, were not in communication during the war, the end of the war, and in business with each other after the war, it's just ridiculous to think that they're not. Of course they were. And if Bormann came out of, the, of this, uh, of World War II, in a position where he had millions and millions of Reichmark dollars, gold, diamonds at his disposal, he was incredibly wealthy. And one thing intelligence services like is to spend money they don't have to ask Congress for. And how did that happen? Uh, in 1947, Truman uh, put Alan Dulles in charge of recovering all the Japanese loot that they had stolen all over their Pacific campaigns and very little of it was ever returned back to the country from where it came. Bormann, I'm sure, did a deal with various intelligence agencies. And now the intelligence services are in the banking business. They have all that money to do whatever they want to do without having to go to Congress to ask for it. I find that entirely plausible. It, not saying, pro or con, that is what uh, it seems that the research shows happened. And again, I find it why not?
Where did all that money go? If somebody didn't get it. And if Bormann got it, you are looking at funds that went from Europe, from Nazi Europe, funneled through Spain to Argentina to two major, major German-owned banks in Buenos Aires that literally laundered all this gold and cash and money, all these funds, way all the way up into 1947. When the deals were done, nice, neat, orderly, the banks closed and dissolved. There was no panic rush of getting this funds out of Europe, out of Germany, because, oh damn, we're losing the war, we have to get it all on trucks now tomorrow. Yes, I'm sure some of that did happen that way. Several tons of gold and silver was taken from the uh, Rice Bank in, in Berlin at the end of the war and hidden and found by the Americans. None of that was returned. As far as I can research, a lot of that was repurposed and re-lent back to Germany in the shape of the Marshall Plan, um, which there are more and more documentation that come out in, in the last decade on that. Um, I mean, there's a little bit like World War One on that, isn't it? Uh, so what did Bormann have to offer these intelligence services uh, to save his ass, besides money? But if he was dead, the money would probably be found anyway. I could see that contention. Let's say we go with the thesis that he did a deal with Alan Dulles for special weapons programs that America needed, because America was still at war with Japan. Now, everybody knew the nuclear bomb was in the works, and everybody wanted one. The Russians wanted one, the British wanted one, the Americans wanted one. The British couldn't really afford one, so they teamed up with the Americans, who eventually just kind of cut out the British from that deal. But for a time there, the British would uh, play ball because they thought they were still part of the nuclear bomb project. What did Bormann have? In 1944, Eric Jetton, U.S. government meteorologist in charge of producing uranium for the bomb project, put out a report that it would not be until December 1945 that America would have enough uranium for to go critical mass until 1945. They did not have or the manufacturing capability of having enough uranium for the bombs they needed for Little Boy. Now, at the end of the war, a submarine, 234, left Hamburg through the Kattegat, where it was hailed by British planes, lit up but not attacked. The British planes attacked everything German that sailed through uh, the Kattegat at that time. Most definitely, other subs were sunk in the same time frame, but not that one. A deal must have been made unless all the British planes who saw it was just, I guess, out of ammunition. It disappeared for 12 days. It was hailed by the British. It called in at the, as the war was lost from a position where it really wasn't. And then it disappeared for 12 days, long enough to make it down to Spain or to the Canary Islands and drop somebody off. That could have been Bormann. Could have been Bormann. And then sailed off. It surrendered in Portsmouth. Very interesting way it surrendered. It was hailed by a Canadian warship that was then uh, blocked by a United American warship that lit literally um, blocked the signal and uh, signaled the submarine to follow it into Portsmouth Harbor. In that submarine there was, uh, well, there had been two Japanese officers because the Japan was supposedly going to go to Japan. Well, when the captain told, uh, told them that he was going to surrender to the Americans, they killed themselves. Very sad. There was 80 gold line canisters with yellow cate uranium. They were supposed to be heavy water. There was an ME-262 jet plane in crates and a Luftwaffe general. Remember the uranium that Americans said they didn't have? Well, here's a bunch of uranium, courtesy of a German submarine. And I guess we had enough uranium for three bombs uh, before December 45, as had previously been stated. There was also a very prominent German scientist called Hans Schlickert and 25 infrared proximity fuses. They are important because the Americans in the Manhattan Project had a problem. In order to detonate a little boy bomb, you have to compress 
all the explosive plates to set off the uranium at the same time, exact same time. And Manhattan Project couldn't figure out how that worked. They couldn't get it right. Without that, they could not set off the bomb. So Hans Schlickert, fortunately, bringing 25 of these fuses with him, he was debriefed in Washington by Luis Alvarez. Remember Luis Alvarez from the Manhattan Project? Luis Alvarez, incidentally, uh, sometime after, received the Nobel Prize for having resolved the compression problem by inventing the infrared proximity fuses. So without German help, without the submarine, could we have, well, maybe we could have got the bomb to work, but probably we couldn't. Um, courtesy of Mr. Borman, possibly, not that many people had the um, clout to send submarines here, there, and everywhere. He certainly did. That certainly could have been a deal. Did you know the Germans worked with phased radar arrays all the way back in 1945? Isn't the Navy just trying to figure that out now? Anyway, doesn't matter. Um, the Germans had a lot of technology uh, that most certainly uh, the Americans wanted. Everybody wanted this German technology because they were pretty damn good at what they did. That was Bormann's card. Bormann was a friends and financier of the SS. Hans Kammler rings a bell, who oversaw the German weapon, the SS weapons program at the Kammler Stab. Gestapo Müller provided security for all. Those three all knew each other, went way back. Uh, Gestapo Müller also disappeared. Uh, some say he went to the Russians, some say he went to the Argentinians. Fact, he disappeared just like Bormann disappeared. Completely different thing when it comes to circumstantial evidence on Bormann. In the 50s, late 1950s, early 1960s, a check has emerged um, for two million dollar withdrawal uh, in a uh, Chase Manhattan bank, uh, I think it was in Buenos Aires, uh, co-signed by Deutsche Bank, that was signed, Martin Bormann. At that point he actually went into a bank and withdrew money under his own name. There's a lot of such evidence about Martin Bormann. And to talk more about gold, Shelmar Schacht, the former finance minister of the Reich, who survived and became a financial consultant to various regimes around the world after that, he confirmed that 20 tons of gold was sent to Jakarta during the war. Now, that is interesting because in Indonesia, where this little, little bank had all this gold, at least 20 tons of gold, that, that's significant. In the years after the war, the Sakharo Revolutionary Fund also had a branch in that very little bank, same address. As a very interesting, mysterious German character that lived very secluded, claiming to be a doctor, um, Georg Anton Poich and his wife uh, lived on the island. He also had a branch in that bank. Um, that's interesting because some people claim that Mr. Poich was actually Adolf Hitler. It hasn't been confirmed. There's no birth date or death date on his uh, tombstone. Which, if you know anything about uh, Muslim law, there has to be a birth date and a death date on the tombstone. But not on, on Georg's tombstone here. And, and his wife disappeared. She went to... Um, Germany quite often. Incidentally, last time she left Indonesia and went to, went to Germany that could be ascertained was at the time Eva Brown's father died, which is all very strange. Coincidence? I am sure I'm not going to go there, but it is pretty damn certain that this guy was a German, that he was a Nazi, that he was hiding. And he had the same bank that 20 million German tons of gold had been deposited. Incidentally, after the revolution in Indonesia, all this gold had disappeared. A lot of lawsuits and heirs wanted it and it belonged to, but they couldn't find it. Now, the interesting thing is an American traveler had come through Jakarta, Indonesia at that time and run into George Anton here and asked who he worked for. What was he doing in the middle of nowhere in this little nice house with his wife? And he said he worked for the ICA, which was a CIA front organization, supposedly one of those aid organizations, that was set up by Alan Dulles. 
nobody knew who the ICA was, really. It only existed for a few years, but it was still a CIA front. So Nazi gold went all over the place, and wherever it went, there was a German in charge of it. Most of them were the link to the various intelligence organizations of the CIA. So what really happened? A lot of speculation, but a lot of documentation. Some research also clears, again, how did Bormann get out? It is said that Section 6 of the uh, British Intelligence Service got him out of Berlin and kept him for debrief for a while. Uh, there's even speculations he uh, sold out people at the Nuremberg trials to his British interrogators and even met Hess. Hess and Bormann knew each other well because Bormann had been Hess's secretary until Hess had been convinced it was a great idea to jump on a plane and fly over to the British, uh, leaving Bormann in charge. Little snapshot, not saying that, of course, has anything to it. According to the U.S. Treasury, Bormann was in charge of uh, 800 million uh, dollars, U.S. 1945 dollars, in Argentina uh, through a fund set up with the help of uh, Evita Perón. And that's what they knew of. What they didn't know of was all the gold and the silver and the diamonds and the patents. So let's face it, Bormann got away with a lot of money, a lot of wealth. Bormann started to plan for exactly what was going to happen after the war with all that German money, all that Nazi loot. He had a plan. He was very meticulous. He expected to survive, and he was going to survive. He's one of the wealthiest men in the world. He controlled all this millions. We're up in the billions. He was in control of all this funds. Do you honestly think that after having funneled out millions and millions and millions and set up a network to receive it and transport it. The transports continued up until 47 to have all this network in place, all these finance, all these transactions. He even had three submarines under his control, the party did, that could continuously go with equipment and radios and again, gold diamonds and so on, to, to back and forth between Argentina during the war. Do you think a man that smart and that calculated would have let himself get caught up in street fighting in Berlin being surrounded by the Russians because I don't think so he was far gone from there before it got to that I don't care how because his plan was in motion it doesn't matter if Hitler or Bormann survived the war really because their legacy on Hitler's part was already established and lived well that is what it was Bormann's legacy was that no one really knew who this man was and he already set in motion the plans for post-war Germany. That was all nailed out from 42 of a vast economic Germanly dominated Reich. And I'm not saying that the EU is the physical embodiment of Bormann's dream. I'm just saying tell you all something. Go look into who funded the EU. Who was in Adenauer's cabinet? Who came up with the ideas? Who, what SS men, what Nazi officials uh, created the foundation for the EEC? And now you tell me uh, Bormann was nowhere to be seen. How did it turn around that all this money uh, came back to the Marshall Plan? Some of this money and gold that was Germany's to begin with. Germany need to be rebuilt and rebuilt fast. And the U.S. was on board with that really quickly. And who would be one to influence events like that? If, of course, intelligence networks and reports and Alan Dulles. And again, what did Eisenhower do in, in Bariloche? What did Obama do in Bariloche? Don't care, but I want to know. Take a little bit of look of who did what when it comes to that. That's not the question. So I'm going to go, what happened to Bormann? Bormann survived the war, and he set up a vast economic structure and he worked with intelligence services and I'm sure he had his finger on the pulse of a lot of things unless of course somebody bumped him off and got all the money but he probably was the only one who knew where all this money was and who was in charge of it with a very tight circle um, 
that would eventually expand and put these funds into various businesses to keep them covered. There's no doubt that the CIA worked with Nazi war criminals. None. It's well documented. There's an enormous amount of eyewitnesses that have seen Bormann there. There are children claiming he's their father. Okay. And the DNA was covered up by the German intelligence, presumably, at least the German government. So you draw your own conclusions, I've drawn mine. I am just saying, 1947 was a very interesting year. 1947, the gold transport into the uh, German Argentinian banks finally ended. 1947, Operation High Jump, where they went to, uh, uh, <laughs> went to Ar Antarctica and something went wrong and they came back real quickly. I mean, Admiral Byrd. 1947, CIA is created. 1947, a bunch of uh, Italian communists tried to take over Italy, but they're rebuffed and they're fought off with a bunch of former SS men waiting in the wings to support the Italian nationalists. 1947, German politicians start talking about the EEC, the Greater European Reich. Oh, I'm sorry, Union, sorry, sorry, Freudian slip. Oh, 1947, the Roswell crash as well. 1947 was a really interesting year, and I probably only scratched the surface of what happened in 1947. But you draw your own conclusions as to what exactly happened to Bormann, but based on what I can see, um, this is what I think he did and what I think happened. All right, that was a lot of talking about two very interesting people um, that needs a lot more scrutiny from history. And remember, I'm not taking sides. I'm really not. I want to know what happened. And it's really hard to find out what happened when history is as skewed as it is and when so many documents are locked away. You literally have to physically go to the archives to get them. You go to the official record, one th it says one thing, it's also always sanitized because, well, you know, you don't want to say everything and you clean it up. And then you go to the, you have to go to the records for that official document to find out what was written in the margins, which is what I have said today has pretty much been based on. Um, I would like to know more. And if you have any specific concrete documentation or you did any FOIA requests on this, I would love to know because I think there's more to it. And I think the world deserves to know. World War II ended 75 years ago. It's time for the truth to come out. Um, believe me, I'm writing a book about the German weapons program now and about Hans Kamla and bloody hell. It's hard to draw out facts that is not misinformation, misinformation, and more than misinformation which I understand that we need. And I understand why our leaders take decisions that are controversial and will cause harm to their own for a bigger picture that if had come through would cause more harm to more of our own. And I understand why intelligence services do things in the discreet and why they have to be kept quiet and why we don't want everybody or anybody to know what we're doing sometimes. I get it. This is a long time ago and everyone involved are dead. I think the world deserves to know because we're paddling in a direction that was set in the 1940s and most people don't even know why. Anyway, as I promise, bonus questions, and I alluded to this, uh, they were asking, what do I think of the documentary uh, Hunting Hitler? It drove me crazy. I, I actually, I actually, I enjoyed it because it was interesting. Uh, several things that are wrong with history and Discovery Channel documentaries is there's way too much recap. I learned more from a 15-minute video on YouTube, which is it's just frustrating because we don't need every after commercial. We don't need a five-minute recap of what was said in the past 15 minutes. We saw the whole thing. Filmmaker's choice, I get it, and one day I'll probably be forced into doing it myself, and I'll, I'll not sleep at night and I'll feel terrible. Um, what annoyed me about Hunting Hitler was there's nothing new that was said. It was set up very nice and elaborate, and there were looked very serious people to investigate things, 
that we all, if you're into this and you serious historian, we all knew everything, every conclusion they came to. Every time they pulled up a picture, well, I know who that guy is. Uh, they said, well, we went to this place. I know who went there. Uh, there's very little new information, and I thought they could have done better and done more. Which leads me to think, well, maybe they didn't want to. Which means, well, I, I, I don't want to see whitewash everywhere because I'm starting to sound like a conspiracy theorist more than a historian. And I, I do resent that. I just want to know what really happened. And I think if you're going to spend that much time and resources, well, then go dig and find something new. And yes, of course, go to the places where they were because you need to show that. But a lot of the information you need, you're going to dig up in an unconventional and boring way and then present that. Not everything you're going to find is going to be found interesting. Um, it's the boring research that nobody wants to see. But that's where you're going to probably find what really happened. And if you're in the system, I would like to see more, a lot more FOIA requests in that show, a lot more official documents, because the ones they presented, we've all already seen. So nothing new, and uh, they're digging in places that, even if they found something, it wouldn't be relevant to where they were going with the show. There's too many tangents in different directions. We spent an entire episode on uh, trying to find out how he could have gone out, and he could have gone to this place, he could have gone to that place. I think there's it's a wasted time that could have spent to, well, if he was somewhere, where did he go? Did you go talk to these people without cameras and get their permission? And I would like to have seen the show done more in depth, but of course that would have not maybe appealed to a broader audience who didn't know the details. Um, and in that sense, yeah, I think it was interesting. Um, I would just like to have seen uh, more. It's the sweeping place with a minesweeper on one field but not the other field because you don't have the time because you have to go film somewhere else. Do it, then do it right. Uh, it's what I have to say on documentaries, nothing else to say that on all documentaries. And I'm seeing the same thing in the, uh, the uh, lost World War II gold. And they were looking for the Japanese treasure in the same place where we spend 15 minutes of the show identifying a rifle bullet, which we could probably just have done right off. We don't, that's not really furthering the story. Um, more hard work, less talk, and love of God, please, less repetition is driving me nuts. Now, I have a bonus question for you. In my research, I've come across a lot of different interesting planes and things. I found this picture, that picture. I have no idea what this thing is or where it came from. I'm guessing some German experimental plane. I know nothing other than this picture and I think it looks really, really interesting. If it existed, if it's real, any of you guys can figure out what this thing is? I want to know. Uh, I want to know so badly that if you find out information on this thing, you let me know, and I will send you a copy of my book. Uh, also, I have been suggested that I will do a, um, um, a giveaway of some of the items from Brothers War that some of you guys are very much a big fan of. And I'm thinking about how to do that, uh, how to find in, uh, well, I guess i got to figure out how to, uh, what to challenge you with as you all challenge me. Um, I'm thinking on it, and I'll let you know. And I will leave you with this uh, picture just because I think it is probably the coolest plane I have ever seen. Uh, obviously, it's made in Russia. My first thought was, holy hell, they made two tank turrets of 16-inch guns fly. Um, I just think this is so cool, I had to show you all. Anyway, I just thought you had to see that because it's hands down one of the coolest planes I've ever seen. Those crazy Russians. I want to go see this thing for real. Anyway... Enough of me talking for today. Uh, send me your questions at this point in time. I think we all realize that whatever they are, uh, shoot them to me, and I will shoot at you right back with some cool and interesting answers to the best of my knowledge. And thank you all, and God bless America.